So this is of course Thomas Wolfe. I don't really know who this is, but apparently he was born in Asheville and made a businessman here. And he also had a wife that was also a businesswoman, I guess you would say. Eight, the youngest of eight children. I don't know about you, but I don't want eight siblings. That's just me. But they have like a little memorial here and I don't really know if I'm able to get in with the camera. This is what the sign looks like. So, let's see. Okay, it has pictures outside and inside. Okay, cool. So guys, I just got a tour of this place. So let's check it out. Okay. was built in 1883. Okay. And I read over that he's the youngest of eight siblings. Did all of his siblings live in this live in this house or just him and his family? Uh, no. Uh, let's see. It's true. He was the last of eight children. But uh, the others basically grew up in W.O.'s house. Oh, okay. That's the father. Oh. Have you read any of Thomas Wolfe? I unfortunately don't really know that much about him. This is the first I've ever heard of him. Oh, okay. Sorry. Well, uh, I'm glad to uh, give you the tour. Um, we'll start talking about W.O., mm -hmm. uh, the father, that he grew up on a farm in Pennsylvania, rather close to Getty, Gettysburg. Oh. And when he was 13 years old, this was in July of 1863, he and his brother went down Confederate soldiers who were walking on the battlefield, and one of the soldiers asked for water, and W.O. went to the pump and got him some water. Cool. Uh, when he uh, when was 15, he left the family car, and he went to Baltimore and got in a training program to be a monument carver, and that's the kind of work that he did the rest of his life. <laughs> At age uh, 18, no, 19, he went to uh, Raleigh, and the attraction there is he was able to open up his own shop, mm -hmm. and he met a woman named Cynthia Hill that he married, and it turned out shortly thereafter that she was tubercular. Oh. So that's what brought Thomas Wolfe's father to this area, the mountains, oh. and um, over in that direction, we can't see anything. generally where it was. When about three blocks over, W.O. built a house. He, he did everything himself. And uh, he planted 200 fruit trees for Cynthia. Oh. However, she died. Oh, that's so sad. I bring you uh, here to show you the Jackson building, the Gothic structure there, the Pax Square. Have you seen it? Uh, probably past, past it. Well, that sits on the exact plot of ground that W.O. Wolf's monument carving shop was in. Oh, really? And while well, this is an award winning Gothic structure, mm -hmm. uh, W.O. Wolf's was in a two story shed. <laughs> and he was uh, at his place of business one day. He heard the door open and he took Campbell along his heels. And it was 
Julia Westall, and she was selling books. Hmm. He bought her books that day, and she said, these are just samples, I'll bring you books next week. He said, that'll be me. <laughs> just like that. Not so fast, Mr. Wolf. She said, <laughs> just so like fast. that. And, uh, fast mover. They got to know each other better, and the following year, 1885, they married. Wow, that's... And then, in the next uh, year, 15 years, up to 1900 now, they, they, they birthed to eight children, with Thomas being the last. Now, jumping to 1904, mm -hmm. Julia Wolf took the children to the World's Fair mm -hmm. in St. Louis. That was a big deal. Of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, exhibitors on the trade ground uh, were from 62 different nations. Wow, that's big. Yeah. Two of her boys had jobs on the fairground. Julia rented a house just off the fairground <laughs> to operate a boarding house. Now, she had never done this before. You know, the house here, that came later. Uh -huh. So, Signs put up out in front of the house. It said, North Carolina House, Julia Wolf Proprietors. That was a big step for her. Sure, it was. That was a very bold one. Very bold. By 1889, he expanded it to 19 rooms. And that's what, and that's what Julia Wolf bought in 1906. 18 rooms? She had, uh, she had earned five hundred dollars. I sure do. She bought the house in 1906 for a minister in Kentucky. And out of nostalgia for his home state, he called it the whole Kentucky. It has nothing to do with Stephen Foster. each other and some would play cards. Two of the daughters played the piano. Effie played a controlled classical style and Mabel was a piano pounder. She would pound out songs like I Wonder Who's Kissing Her Now and Alexander's Ragtime Band. <laughs> now over on the left hand wall you see a sofa. Mm -hmm. That's the location where W.O. Wolf was laid out when he died. And I don't know how much you know about Thomas Wolf, but he died early. Mm -hmm. He was not quite 30 years old. And he was also laid out in that same location. Okay. Oh. We had a terrible fire in July of 1998. An arsonist threw a rock or a brick through one of these windows and there was an accelerant on it and whoosh, this room took off. This room was destroyed, up above was damaged very heavily. The story goes that a person staying at the Renaissance Hotel across the street was up at 3 a.m. looking out the window and saw somebody in the yard making a throwing motion. And, and, uh, and, and then uh, all the windows brightened soundlessly. Oh my gosh. So that person called the fire department. They were two blocks away. They were here at 3.07 a.m. They didn't use any chemicals. They knew this house was important to Asheville. So uh, they said,
saved the house to some extent. I say to some extent, they kind of limited it to this side of the house. Although, all the windows were smashed and fighting the fire, and there was smoke and water damage through it. We're owned by the state. The state collected insurance money. They raised money privately. And uh, then they kicked in the rest to restore it to the way it looked in 1916. the year that Julia Wolf expanded the house from the 18 rooms she had bought in 06 to the 29 rooms that became that year. And that's what it is now. 17 of those are bedrooms. And you might notice these have little light fixtures, the bulbs and cords. Uh, that's the way it, they looked according to pictures we have of 1916. They also got to before sunup to after sundown, day after day after day. Was she the only cook here? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, we just passed an ice box in the hallway. Mm -hmm. And that's a pie safe over there. A what? A pie safe. A pie safe. That's where uh, you're baking pies. And with a boarding house, you might, you know, mm. bake two or three or four at a time. Uh, no. And then you, you put them in there. Okay. Uh, so, an old fashioned thing, you know, that, you know making pies. <laughs> uh, this is a, a wood burning stove, and that was replaced by a gas burning stove. This cutting table goes back to 1916. Many people ask, you know, what kind of help did she have? in this late intensive of business. Her two daughters for a while. But, uh, Effie and, uh, and uh, Mabel both got married and moved on. Mm -hmm. In Look Homer Angel, his first and best novel, he used some uh, old-fashioned words like negresses. African-American women worked here. Now, Julia was the kind of woman who believed in working hard, working effectively, making a profit, saving money, and buying real estate. The women who worked for her didn't have that orientation, mm -hmm. and some would quit. Others, she would say, you don't need to come back here anymore. And she'd send one of her boys over to the African-American neighborhood a couple blocks away to get new employees said, is you this wolf's boy? Because if you would, I ain't going. Now, looking at 1906 again, the price agreed upon for Julia to buy this house was $6,500. And she had an unusual mortgage that you might not have heard about. An annual mortgage. She had to make a payment once a year in here from the Woodfield Street house, she brought her youngest child, Thomas. He was not quite six years old. Staying at the house on Woodfield Street was W.O. with his daughter Mabel, cooking and cleaning for her father, his brother's friend, and her mother. Do you think the neighbors gossiped? Oh, totally. Sure. Totally. Right. This was a very uh, gossipy uh, it was unusual for a family to be separated. Even though it was only three blocks, it seemed much because the world of the boarding house was the world of the house seemed, seemed so different. Now, a typical day for W.O., he'd get up to the Whitman Street house with a girl named Leslie who died at nine months. I mentioned that she gave birth to eight children, but she had the sad fate of losing four of them in her own lifetime. Ugh. This was Cynthia Hill, W.O.'s prior wife, who died of tuberculosis. How long did she live? I don't know her age at death. She might have been 40 something. That's just a guess. But do you think that this picture was here when Julia was here? Maybe not. Probably not. Side 
secretary. It's partly a bookcase. Now, W.O. only went to school until age 15. But as an adult, he bought books. And over there is the Brothers Karamazov. Good if you if you want to try to get the titles. And then there's uh Les Miserables. And here's some books by oh uh, Robert Louis Stevenson. Oh cool. And uh, Harvard Classics down here. Yep. Yeah. Wow. The Three Musketeers by Boomer. So <laughs> he had terrific literature. <laughs> he, he did read some of them. Well, of course. I don't even read all my books. No, we all have that problem. Mm -hmm. It goes along and along. Um, so, uh, his son Thomas read more of them. Uh, he had three drawers for clothing, this folded down to write on, and a good sized mirror. I'm, get, I'm assuming if we had a, that chair. Because I mean, he had a chair to stand or to write on when he was writing. I don't know. Uh, he was a pretty tall man. Uh, this seems like he was, he was six foot three. So I don't know. He seems. What is this right here? He probably did have to sit in a chair. <laughs> okay. Now, 1892 was the year of Julia Gaines. Presidential election year. The candidates were Grover Cleveland and Benjamin Harrison. Yeah. That's what they named the boys. Benjamin Harrison. You got it. That's so right. it was a full thing. Benjamin Harrison Wolf and Grover Cleveland Wolf. <laughs> W.O. was in downtown Asheville. He saw the editor of the paper and he said something like, You'll never guess what happened in our house last night. Grover Cleveland and Benjamin Harrison came, and they're going to stay. <laughs> to the public, uh, this room has been rented. I could well imagine a couple using that bed, and maybe one or two children over here. It's a little cramped, even for me. Pardon? It's a little cramped, even for me. Well, people were smaller, sort of. Not everywhere, of course, but uh, this is another uh, piece of antique furniture. It must look strange uh, to see that cabinet up there. But this was called a gentleman's dresser. And gentlemen wore tall hats in those days. So there you go. That's where the hat would go. Uh-huh. That's where the top hat. So there are four of these in the house. They probably stopped making. It is. And this is much like the parlor. It's a room for people to hang out. The big troll over there was the kind of man who played the record. The other piano, the brothers were around, they might play more if they want to. Uh, but if they want to get a guest to play, they could take the lamp and put it in the corner. They uh, could take the table and put it off the side. They could roll up the rug and they could dance. The girl still was looking for a home. Mm -hmm. He said that because his mother took the cash from him. Many times he had asked him, what room shall I occupy tonight? And she had a full house.
but in the summer of 1917, he did spend a month or so on here. He also met a girl. She said, well, I'm going home tomorrow. sold very well in uh, various places. Every place except Germany uh, uh, routinely uh, sent uh, royalty checks in the mail. The German government required that the royalties from sales of the book in their country be spent in Germany. Wolf didn't mind. He was young, he was single, he liked the German people, the German food, German beer. And um, in the early 30s, he was politically naive. Uh, some of the people that he had met on the prior trip were not around. And the people he asked could not adequately explain what was going on. It was frightening, and he grew angry. And about the last hundred pages, of his last major novel called You Can't Go Home Again is a fictionalization of his uh, German experience. The last time Wolf was in Germany was at the time of the Berlin Olympics, 1936. He 
was a guest of the American ambassador's daughter. And they had these boxes. And the afternoon that they were out there, Jesse Owens, a great American sprinter, won a medal event. Thomas Wolf stood up and gave a rebel yell. <laughs> well known in the Civil War. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and right across the aisle from them was Hitler and his cronies. Whoops! <laughs> We've got to get out of here quickly. <laughs> and they did. They walked fast and got out of the stadium. Okay, we'll go this way. Because of this photograph, that's the house that W.O. built with his own hands. And that was taken down about 1955. By the way, the fire of 1998 roared through here and through the roof. Uh, and this was the birthing bed. Julia gave birth to all eight children in this bed. It's a set made of pine includes the dresser over there and behind the door here uh, this wash basin and after the fire was out a truck showed up from the Biltmore State Carpentry Shop mm -hmm. and they took these three pieces to the carpentry shop to store them and put them in a warehouse until we were able to reopen Wow, oh, that's cool Yeah, yes they did send a bill <laughs> of course they did. Of course they did. And yes, we paid the bill, and yes, we're grateful that they did. Uh, a museum without its furniture uh, just isn't as good. Yeah. Another neat thing that happened is there was a young woman who was a curator on the restoration job. Mm -hmm. And uh, she had an old magazine by Thomas Wolfe with a, uh, an article, a nonfiction piece, growing up in Asheville and everything that happened. And there's a picture of the headboard of his mother's bed with the medallion featured in the circular piece. Uh -huh. And so uh, she called the carpenter shop and the man told her where they were working on it. So she's there, she's in a chair, she's got the magazine open, and he's got sandpaper in his hand. There have been other designs imposed on top of that so he had to do the sandpaper on the bottom. And she watched and found it kind of an exciting process. And he completed it with paint. Now, let's say you were staying here at this uh, boarding house, and that were your room out there. You would have to go through other people's room to get to your room, right? Mm-hmm. So... Pictures. I mean, the, the windows. Uh, they're not uh, stained glass, but they are called antique colored glass. And there were so many Victorian era homes taken down here uh, in recent decades that we were able to buy all we needed, which was for every window in the house. At first, it was hard to replace curtains like this, bedspreads like that, old fashioned design. Ben was an older brother of Thomas Wolfe's, a favorite older brother. The boys liked throwing punches at one another, <laughs> and Ben would defend Thomas, who for a while was the smallest in the, in the family. Um, so uh, Ben uh, also was an overlooked child himself. He, uh, he got up to ninth grade in school, then he dropped out. It was months before his parents were even aware of it. They were so busy running a boarding house and running a car and shop. Um, and, uh, he never did get back to high school. But he was always employed and he was generous with his money. Uh, after a year and a half or so, he realized that boys his age in high school were learning things that he didn't know about. And he developed a resentment that he directed towards. Now, in this death scene, uh, I mentioned uh, about Ben, he's 
26 years old. He has influenza. Mm -hmm. They called it Spanish influenza in one case. This is 1918. And Dr. Oz wrote about a year ago that there was 500,000 Americans who died of influenza in 1918. Ben was just one of them. And he had never lived in this house you know, he grew up at the Woodford Street house. He spent about the last three, four weeks of his life dying. Now, in this chair is the old man, W.O. And uh, if we listen carefully, we hear him muttering something like, Whoa, is me. Whoa, is me. Where am I going to get a thousand dollars for the funeral? He's got the money. Now, I'm gathered in this room. Mabel, you know, she's a piano, piano comedy girl. Mabel is emotional, she's loving, she's nursed her father through hangovers. She doesn't like what he said. She comes rushing in here, she says, Shut up, you old man, it's been that sick, not you. <laughs> Julia is up from the kitchen. She's got a towel she had dampened. She, she went to wipe his brow and he chased her out of the room. Next morning, they gathered around the table downstairs and agreed to give Ben a wonderful funeral. Kirk, in this story, in, in the novel, well, in real life, she stayed here. She was a woman who always traveled alone, uh, was getting to be middle-aged, and might have a half pint in her purse. Some people smile, some people frown. Nobody ever did that. <laughs> Give him the big thumbs up. So, um, uh, Julia uh, didn't like this. Uh, and she was heard to say, that woman is too old for my son. <laughs> well, when, when Mrs. Perk heard about Ben's illness, she made a beeline for Asheville. She stayed at a boarding house. Mm -hmm. and, uh, she looked through the curtains, and she saw Julia leave the house. She scurried over, go to the kitchen, warm up some soup, take it up to Ben. Now, in the novel Look Home an Angel, the Thomas Wolfer uh, uh, character is called Eugene Gant. So I'm going to refer to him as Eugene. Eugene went out the following day after the funeral to visit with his favorite old brother. And Mrs. Perk was standing out there. They had pleasant conversation for some minutes. And then she turned to him and said, Well, Eugene, we really love you.
There's a sensor. <laughs> Anybody? 